But uh, hey, everybody, it's Thursday night. We're back here again. So I just want to make sure you got a full view. Okay, there you go. All right, everybody, it's uh, TIP because SIP. It's Thursday, Thursday, and this week it is B L I S S. It's Bliss time. So uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun tonight, uh, taste some uh, new release wines. Um, we just released both of these wines uh, May 1st uh, to uh, our distributors. You should be seeing them on your shelves here probably the next month or so. Um, and you'll be able to start ordering them out to um, the tasting room and wine club immediately. We'll, we'll sell anything anytime to anybody. So that's, you know, that's our motto. But anyway, hey, let's not forget who's all here tonight. We got Kevin Brutico. Hey, Kevin. Hey, guys. Of course, we got David Brutico. Hey, David. Hello. So, hey, we're all set, ready to go. So, the gang's all here. You're there, and we have wine. I guess it's time. So, this week, uh, we're kind of changing things up. We're moving over to Bliss. Uh, we've worked through most of the Brutico wines, so now we're going to start working on some Bliss wines. Um, we kind of worked through all the Brutico wines. We're going to do a few here uh, over the next few weeks. Um, but one of the things is that uh, tonight it's all about bliss. But before I go any farther, I would like to thank our great geologist, professor of geology at Brutico University. That'd be Lynn Brutico, Emeritus. So uh, thank you so much for what uh, you showed us and uh, digging a little bit deeper into the soils and uh, kind of explaining that a little bit more. It's really great information. Um, there will be a test later. So um, don't worry. We cheat. It's okay. Um, Anyway, uh, some of the things that were going to be happening. So next four weeks, and we'll talk about this later, about the wines. We want you to choose what wines we're going to do next. So I'm going to give you a list of four wines here a little bit later on, and you guys vote through the comment section which one you want to see, and that's the way we're going to go. Um, so we'll have a little bit of fun doing it that way. Um, and uh, we're going to play around doing some different things, hopefully next uh, week. Um, I'm actually going to be out in the winery doing a winery tour live with you guys a little bit. Uh, we're going to be playing around to see if we can make that happen. So a lot of new and different things happening. Um, we're actually going to have a guest host here uh, on the uh, first week of June. Uh, who's actually going to be doing the tasting instead of me, um, Steve Brutico. But um, he doesn't know that yet. We just told him. Uh, so anyway, so we're going to be having some fun with that. All right. So. Here we go. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's start with um, our Bliss Chardonnay. First, before we do anything else, let's talk about Bliss. Let's talk about Bliss branding and Brutico branding. So Bliss is our everyday wine. Bliss is that wine we're going to have every day. Uh, it's the wine we're going to have while we're making dinner, and Brutico is what we're going to serve with dinner. So that's our whole idea right there, and that's what we want to do. Um, so Bliss is uh, made a little bit differently. We talked about how walking through the vineyards and how we select the different parts of the blocks and doing that and how we, uh, you know, make Bliss a little bit different than the Brutica wine. So we'll start with our Bliss Chardonnay, 2018 Bliss Chardonnay. Um, it's been in a bottle for about a year um, under screw cap uh, for your ease of convenience while picnicking in your backyard. Um, so the thing is, is this is all tank fermented, so it's not barrel, so it's not going to be that same depth, that same big, rich character as a barrel fermentation, but it's going to be a, a different, more citrusy, uh, tropical characters, um, so with this wine. And it's your, it's your great backyard patio, you know, wine. It's, you know, while you're sitting in the kitchen, while you're cooking or talking, you know, you're just having that nice glass of wine that you really enjoy or after work, relaxing, or after a hard day of watching the Tiger King videos, you know, whatever. So, and so when you, when you taste this wine, you've kind of look at this wine, you can tell right away, it is a little bit different. It's not as dark as in a hue of uh, a yellow as the Brutico Chardonnay. So that's your first big difference you're going to notice on that. And then when you smell it, the first thing I get out of this wine coming up is I get this kind of um, real citrusy, almost um, like a lemon curd kind of a note, but it's very citrusy, very bright fruit coming through. And then almost orange blossom right now. It's been sitting in my glass, I've been warming it up and it's, yeah, it's almost like, reminds me almost of orange water, you know? God, gin fizz sounds so good right now. Um, so you get that beautiful orange water, orange blossoms aroma coming through. And then behind that, there's like some melon, um, not quite honeydew, um, you know, but there's a um, kind of a more of a 
you know, cantaloupe is like, I think it's a, a richer melon. I'm thinking something that's a little bit brighter than that. Probably more like a, maybe, a, maybe it is honeydew, but kind of a little bit brighter melon. And then, uh, and then in the very back, kind of a mango, mango star fruit, that tropical note kind of comes through in the very back end. So there's a lot of aromatics going on, and that's because of that tank fermentation that we keep it cold, um, and we still stir the leaves up to get some body going, but um, we want the, the, those esters of these different blocks. So this is one wine, uh, both these wines tonight, which is kind of unique, come from many different blocks in our repertoire. So um, there's Felice Chardonnay in here, um, so that's a little bit different. That's going to give you different aromatics. And I think that's more of those tropicals are coming from. And uh, then on the Bliss Ranch for the Chardonnays, there's, um, there's blocks on either side of the road. And you can, if you memorize that soil map, there's about three different soil types just on the Bliss Ranch where the Chardonnay is planted. So you're getting all those different characteristics. Um, so the one thing that's happening is that they're also younger Chardonnay vines. That's where that brighter, um, a lot more of the, um, the citrus aromas are coming from and that brighter acid kind of comes from. So you're getting that, that depth of those aromas coming from there. We do put a little bit of oak on this wine in the tank, but it's untoasted. And that actually helps with the mouthfeel and gives it a bit, little bit more oomph. Um, it actually helps with those flavors and aromas to come out. So you're not really getting a lot of those toasted oak flavors in this wine. You're getting... Um, you're, you're getting that raw oak, what it does and how it chemically balances the wine. It kind of uplifts some different things. All right. Now, there is, when you first taste this wine, there's a nice creaminess. That creaminess is from that lees that's in the tank that we stir up and we bring it back up into that wine. And that's some of that oak helping that. So you get that creaminess, and then you kind of get a, a tart, kind of a little more of a, a tart fruit flavor, um, almost like a, almost not quite lemon tart, but it's still, it's like tangerine. It's like that tartar orangey style. Um, and, and it's right there. You get that nice feeling in your mouth, that mid palate, there's good acid there. It's a little bit lighter in the mouth compared to the Brutico because of that barrel, you don't have that big barrel influence. And you can see, but it's that lighter style. You can see on a warm summer afternoon or even, you know, just sitting in front of a fire, we got a nice big raging fire going. It's that nice refreshing flavor profile, this wine. This wine, right now, I'll taste this wine, uh, about, um, you know, like prosciutto wrapped uh, melon right now, I think would be just an awesome thing with this uh, because that salt of the prosciutto along with the sweetness of the prosciutto but then that melon. Uh, would really go well with this with this wine, um, and like most Chardonnays, most most seafoods, you know, still there's that type of a thing. Um, your lighter fares, maybe even a, a type of uh, appetizers. A big meal with this wine would be a little difficult, I think, to pair. It would work, you know, just to enjoy the wine and have it. It's not going to enhance the meal or enhance the wine anymore. This wine is a wine that could probably be overpowered very easily by, you know, like a, a larger dinner style meal. But as an app, but as a wine with appetizers, it's perfect. It's a little bit lighter fare, easier going, compare more with the lighter appetizer, especially cheese plates and that type of thing. You don't have to worry about that much. And then your heavier, uh, heavier, bigger Chardonnay, like our Brutico Chardonnay or the Reserve Chardonnay, would be that which you'd want to see perfectly on the uh, dinner table to go with your entrees. So it works out well. Um, the other thing, and uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more here after we talk about the uh, Blissful Red, but there's uh, cocktails. This wine would make some excellent cocktails. But anyway, um, moving forward, again, very bright, very fun, very refreshing style of Chardonnay. It's not just, it's not a Chardonnay where somebody who doesn't like oak is gonna, is, is still gonna like it. Somebody who wants a little oak in her Chardonnay, it's nice and bright and refreshing. Um, so on a hot day, you know, it's better than a heart, than a seltzer, okay? It's better than white call, that's all I'm gonna say. Uh, you know, and it'd be a lot more fun um, after two or three of these as compared to a white cloth. Um, so that's the Chardonnay. That's where we're at with that wine. Um, 
I see that Kevin has thrown up a uh, vote for next week's wine. Uh, it's out there. Uh, make sure you hit that uh, and tell us which wine you want us to go for next week. It's going to be one single wine. Um, it's either going to be the Barbera, the Syrah, uh, Sangiovese, or Candelabra. We're going to do one wine. We're going to focus on it, probably do a little bit more in depth in the vineyard on that wine. I'll kind of show you because these are small bottlings like the Sangiovese, we do 100 cases. The Barbera, 100 to 200 cases. Candelabra is around 300 cases. Uh, the Syrah, again, it's around 100 to 200 cases. Very small, limited bottlings uh, that we have at the exclusively um, at the tasting room. So it'll be kind of a fun thing to, to go and adventure into and see these different varietals that we talk about that you don't really get the taste. So hopefully you guys have bought the six pack You'll get those wines and we'll be able to go through those a little bit more. All right. So, <clears throat> got a question on the Chardonnay. Sure. Um, you said it was tank fermented and not barrel fermented mm -hmm. uh, and that you put some oak in there. So, will you explain how you get oak in there? So, basically, what we have is uh, all right, that worked. So, this is a barrel stake, right? So, what they do is we actually have uh, wood that's similar to a barrel stave. Um, it's a little bit thinner. And what I'll do is I'll bring some in next week and I will show you um, what they look like. Um, and they're, they're nice thin pieces of wood. I actually had some in here at one time, but uh, I took them out. Um, they're very thin. They're about uh, anywhere from a half inch to a quarter of an inch thick, but they're about, the, they're about two inches wide and they're about a meter long or three feet long. So what these are is they're just pieces of oak that would be used for a barrel and because, because they had some defects in it, what they do is they use it for what's called an oak alternative. So what that means is that um, it probably had some grain issues or it had a knot in it somewhere that would cause a leak if they made a stave out of it. So they called it out early and then resawed it down or resawed it down to that sizing and then toasted it up and or not toasted it. The ones we get are not toasted and you get them toasted, which in most of our bliss wines, we do use these oak alternatives that are toasted, and they can either come in a big sack um, or, uh, or in staves. And so what I'll do next week, um, and Kevin will have to remember to do this, is that when I'm out walking in a winery, I'll show you oak alternatives. I'll show you what we use for the Bliss, um, the Bliss program and make sure that you can kind of see that. Um, it won't be as exciting as me digging up dirt out in the vineyard like Lenny did, but you know we'll, we'll be able to flip around some staves, take a look at it, um, and, and take a, and, dive into oak alternatives for our bliss program. Um, so that's kind of how it is. What we do is we put those in a tank, we suspend them, we, we chain them off inside the tank. And so they just kind of float around, um, hover inside the wine. Um, we mix them, when we mix the leaves up with the pump, it kind of mixes the wine around those. And um, that's how you get that oak experience through that. So instead of just touching on an oak stave, you're only touching one side of it what oak alternatives you touch all 360 degrees all the way around so that way you're getting a different oak experience because of that so all right all right i see people are campaigning for different wines i love it that's good all right so um any other questions about the chardonnay we can come back to it no worries don't worry about it um any point in time ask a question so let's go to blissful red um Originally it was called uh, Schoolhouse Red. Um, we changed the name uh, because of a, uh, there was a, another winery that had that name and so we changed it to, went to Blissful. So here's the thing about good old Blissful Red. Um, you're gonna hear me say Bled. Um, that's its nickname, that's what we call it here at the winery. We don't like to use uh, full names, you know, Blissful Red's kinda tough. So we just say Bled, B-L-E-D. It used to be Shred for Schoolhouse Red, so, you know, naturally we progress. So, this wine is very unique for the Bliss program. Um, our old friend Jeff Miller used to call it declassified Brutico, and I love that expression of it. So what happens is when I make the Brutico wines, I always make extra. I don't make exactly enough to just to do whatever cases we want to produce. Um, there's always a little bit that quite, maybe doesn't quite make it that I didn't like as much and might bring wine quality down. So maybe we do do less cases that year of that wine because I want to call out that little, uh, that lot because it just wasn't as good as I was hoping it was going to be. And it makes the wine better by leaving it out. 
but it doesn't mean that it's bad, it just brings down that blend. But so what you're getting is that you're getting barrel aged wine in a Bliss product. So that's why these vintages are always off a year or two from some of the other Bliss wines because of that, because we have nowhere else to put it, so we make our own blend of that wine. So you're getting all the qualities of barrel aging uh, in a, you know, a year to 18 months in barrel, uh, now in a bottle of Bliss product, which is, uh, which is amazing, because you just get these great blends. And these blends go back and forth. It all depends, um, year to year. Um, some years they're really Bordeaux centric, some years they're really Italian centric. Um, so they kind of go back and forth. Um, the flavor profile, um, yeah, it does change. It's not really consistent, but it all depends on what wines kind of we have left over and what we're blending into them. Now this wine is one of the most unique blends I think I've ever made. Um, we grow a lot of different red grapes here at, uh, at Brutico, and there's only one red grape we do not grow in this wine, and that's Pinot. Every red grape we grow is in here, but Pinot, and the only actually other two wines that aren't in here that we grow is Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. So, are you guys ready for this? And this one I have to read off a list because I'll never remember. So this wine is 27% Zinfandel, 15% Merlot, 14% Carignan, 8% Syrah, 8% Petit Syrah, 7% Sangiovese, 7% Malbec, 6% Primitivo, 4% Barbera, 2% Petit Verdot, and 2% Dolcetto. Now, in all that mix, overall, from topping back and forth, there is point, point, 1% Cabernet in this wine. So every red wine that we make, except for Pinot Noir, and if I took it out to the thousands, I probably could find, you know, a thousandth of a percent of Pinot in here too. Uh, but no, I didn't do that. So this wine is basically 25% Rhone varieties and 19% Italian varieties. So it's gonna, so it's gonna go towards that leaner style of a Rhone Italian. Um, but you know, because the Zin, even though the Zin's the main portion, those two varietals are really going to take over those two regional uh, wines, and you'll see that when you smell it. But the thing is, it is such an interesting wine, but it is a really old world wine. And what I mean by that is that it is a little bit leaner, but it needs to open up. It's a wine that you can't just pop the bottle right away, pour in a glass, and all of a sudden, it's like when you first go to it, it's like, whoa, this is kind of off. Something's wrong. You give that wine three minutes in that glass and aerate a little bit, all of a sudden you have a totally different glass of wine. Now, while I was learning about soils from Len with you guys, I was sitting here swirling my glass and smelling it and tasting it, and every time I did, I picked up something new, something different. I'll be honest with you, this is, uh, last night was the first time I've had this wine since we bottled it. And I had it with pasta primavera with cauliflower noodles, believe it or not, yeah. Um, health conscious vegetarian night. Um, and it really worked really well with that, with that wine because um, this wine is that pizza pasta wine. This is your backyard barbecue wine. This is your red wine cooler wine. And I'm going to tell you, it makes killer wine coolers. So, um, anyway, so when you bring this wine up, the first thing I kind of get out of this is I get some great floral notes. There is these, these florals. There is some violet. There is some kind of a floral action. Then you get a little bit of toast from it, from the barrel. You're, gonna, you're seeing that kind of coming in. And then as this wine wakens up, all of a sudden, through the prog, it progressed from, for me, from being totally a 100% violets, muted fruit, to all of a sudden I got blueberries. Then all of a sudden I got berry. Then all of a sudden I got plum. And now all of a sudden the wood is starting to show so now I'm getting a little bit more toastiness from the oak. Behind that, I'm still getting that plummy, dark fruit. There's some, uh, probably some berry, a little, a little berry back there, and uh, like cranberries too. You know, that tartar, a little tartar fruit coming through. And it's um, maybe a hint of cinnamon also from the barrel, because there are some new barrels in this. It does have a little bit of new oak. Not a lot, 
Um, overall, if you probably looked at this, it maybe has like 4% new oak. But it has, a lot of this might be one year old oak where it's still gonna give a little bit of characters to it. Um, and then again, we might put this blend together and then in a tank add a little bit of oak to it uh, through oak alternatives just to help it out and then beef up the mid palate a little bit more and it might be coming from that too. Um, I love that hit of that, that big blast of fruit. It's dark. It's it's a really nice kind of a dark fruit. Rolls into a kind of a I don't know like cranberries and like a tart cherry maybe in there. Nice acid right in the middle kind of pops up really fast. That's what reminds me of being a little more old world. A little more acid in that mid palate, lengthens out. You kind of get that roll of that kind of um, almost um, a chocolate mocha kind of a thing going on in the back end with some, um, there's some berry, there's some berry fruit on that finish. There's almost a, There's that acid and the tannins. The tannins are really kind of a little unresolved right now. They're gonna mellow out a little bit more. Again, this wine has only been in a bottle for a year. But it's um, but they're coming back around. And that's that kind of a dryness you get on the on the front end of your teeth. Those 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 tannins are kind of showing a little bit more. Um, at first, when we first opened this, they weren't as pungent, but now all of a sudden they're coming out a little bit more. And there's some great there's a great little fruit on the back end of this that I really enjoy and fun, but it's, it's such a great wine that you can think about, you know, when you're having some just, uh, right now I'm thinking about if I had short ribs or a rack of, you know, a rack of ribs with some, you know, great like uh, tart, uh, spicy barbecue sauce to dip in, this is the wine that this is going to work really well with. This will take a little spicier food. This wine will do it. It's going to intensify that spice a little bit more because of the acidity. But it's a wine that's going to stand up to it. It's got all those different flavor compounds. This is also a wine you're going to find out is as you taste different foods, it's going to really explode. Um, I would think that this is going to do really well with something, um, God, like capers. I can just see something more salty, saltier kind of a... Uh, um, charcuterie plates would really, really do saltier cheeses like that. That really salty, briny Parmesan cheese, think about that. And this wine would do really well. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, one of my favorite things to do in, you know, with this wine is throw it in the refrigerator and get it cold and drink it cold. I really, I do, I like it a lot colder during a summer day and watch it warm up. This wine does well. It does really well uh, when you take a glass of ice Fill it about two-thirds full with this. A shot of um, your favorite uh, grapefruit soda squirt and, um, and a shot of club soda on top of it. It makes excellent, excellent wine coolers um, for those super hot days that are muggy and you're hanging out in the backyard. Our sangria, your sangria recipe. Um, you know, it's, I don't often recommend our wines to be used that way, but these are two wines that really show, like if you want a white wine cooler, or a red wine cooler, which sometimes it's just so hot, it's just so refreshing and fun to play with, uh, to do that. Um, but always, you know, I always do about two thirds wine, a little bit of a, I like like Fresca or, or Squirt is a grapefruit style soda on top of it, and then uh, club soda, just to give it that little bit more fizz and, uh, and a little bit more sharpness with the wine. And it's just this uh, big refreshing and you know, a nice slice of uh, fresh fruit. I don't know why, it just looks good and classy, right? Um, so it's in case you run out of wine, you can suck on the fruit later. I, I don't know why, that's, it, it, it amazes me. Um, anyhow, so that's what I'm looking at right here. You know, like again, I said, you know, a great sangria. This wine I make a great sangria. And just think about barbecue, God, even brisket. I can see this with a great brisket too. Um, I'm just seeing that barbecue and that pasta, that, that, that pizza coming off the fire, um, 
a great marinara sauce, that big spicy meat sauce with meatballs in this wine. This wine is that old world wine. You want those old world flavors. Anything on the Mediterranean diet plan would work with this wine, I would say, uh, because I think that's its tasting realm out there. Um, one of the things that keeps popping in my mind right now is when I went to, uh, me and my wife went and visited our family and uh, my family in Italy, uh, was the uh, artichokes, the sliced fried artichokes. So, uh, all right, knew he was paying attention. <laughs> yeah, there's the backyard and two glasses of wine. That away, girl. Anyway, you gotta love it. Only my dog. Anyway, so. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so that's a lot of fun and it's a great wine. It's a real fun wine to experiment with, with different foods because of all those different, uh, different varietals in there. Enjoy it, you know, enjoy it with what you want. Um, like I said, this is uh, my go-to summer wine in the backyard uh, when it's hot. And because if it's just all of a sudden you just, it's not, it's not, you're not feeling it. Instead of a beer, you make a nice wine cooler with it or, and you're ready to go to dinner and it's a great wine with anything it's going to cook on the barbecue. Um, it's an awesome thing. Haas, how do you think this compares to the 2016? This is a lot leaner, more old world. 2016, a lot bigger, more Syrah based, so it's going to be a lot more, uh, a, a bigger, heavier wine. So the mid palate, this is a lot, like when I'm talking leaner, you notice how in the mid palate of this wine, it's kind of, it's a little bit lighter, and that's a leaner style, where the Syrah, the Syrah portion, um, if I remember right, in the 16s, it was a lot more. I think it actually had more cab in it too. So it's a more of a bigger, red table wine, I would say. Um, I actually, I like that wine. I drink a lot of that and I really like it. This isn't my everyday red wine. I really like this one for a summer wine. I really do like this for a barbecue wine. I think this is just an excellent barbecue wine for me. Um, I, will, I will do a lot of testing for you. Um, if you want, I'll draw a map like Len had, you know, so I won't look so bad. And you know, just number it up. Maybe I'll take some, maybe I'll take a cow and just put you know numbers on it so you'll know um, how many times we tried that cut with this wine. Um, and having fun, no, I'm just kidding. No, I will. Um, anyway, so it's just, that's the, that's what we're looking at here and that's what we're kind of doing, but yeah, that's, that's the reason why. Haas, uh, what, what is your expression of tannins that have resolved themselves? Does it mean that they are the, at the back of your palate or are they consistent throughout the tasting of the wine? Well, they're not overpowering. There is a, they become a balance in the wine. So you don't want anything to be over, you don't want acid or tannin to be a single shot high point that stays there. And right now these tannins are pretty much, they're up front still and they, they hit and they, they land and they don't go anywhere. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for um, those tannins to show their presence but then back off gently again and that's what I mean when they're resolved that's what usually happens so that means remember we talked about before how the tannins start linking up to each other um, and, uh, and by doing that they um, they resolve they, they're not as potent they're not as strong in the flavor profile so that's what we're gonna wait for to do that and because of these screw caps um, you know they're see if I can pop one out here for you because of these liners and the, the breathability, um, excuse me while I do surgery. So this liner right here is, is in the bottom of these caps. So this is just a piece of aluminum right now. This is called is a Serenex liner. So this is what allows the air. It actually does breathe. It doesn't breathe quite as well as a cork, so it takes a little bit longer to resolve in the bottle. Um, than it does uh, with a cork finish. But we try to make the wines so they resolve a little bit sooner uh, so they won't, um, it won't take like an extra four or five years for it to resolve. It will resolve in a normal period of time like the same closure we'd use beforehand. So that's what we're kind of, so that's the reason why and that's what I'm talking about when we're talking about resolving tannins. So we have any more questions? Who's in the lead? Candelabra's in the lead. Barbera's in a close second. Sangiovese's just coming up on the outside. Syrah's lagging on the rail. So uh, we'll see what happens here. Hopefully you guys have your wines. We'll run this until we uh, drop out. So we'll see what happens.
Where are the vines right now? In the vineyard. Um, sorry, I had to do it. I had to do it. We are some of the varietals, um, and Lynn can chime in on this too. I would say most of the Chardonnay and the Sauvignon Blanc are in bloom. Um, should be about 100% bloom, I would say, probably within the next three to four days of warm weather we're getting. Um, we got about uh, anywhere from 18 to 24 inches of growth uh, on the top of the line. Um, lens crews are going through right now. We're suckering and moving the wires up to the first notch. So we're starting to bring everything up. Um, everything, most everything should probably be in bloom within the next uh, seven to 10 days, except for Contento Cab, which will probably be about another four to five days behind that before it's 100% in bloom, but everything's starting to show. Uh, right now is our probably most critical time uh, during bloom to make sure that um, we don't uh, get to uh, any heavy winds or rain right now could really hurt us. So we have to watch that a little bit more. But uh, uh, otherwise, uh, that's kind of where the vineyards are right now. Moving through, we're going to go through and start to, we'll start assessing. I'll start driving around a little bit more and looking at the vineyards because I can see the growth patterns in the vineyards and see uh, kind of in my mind where some of the areas we might uh, be picking different uh, for different programs a little bit more. Will, will you explain uh, you move the wires? Yeah. So we have what's called the trellis system. So we have what's called a vertical, uh, vertical trellis. So there are wires that hang down and what happens is as the vine grows it kind of falls over. What we do is we move the wires up and latch them into the, the stake so that it holds the vine up. So it's no different than putting a cage around your tomato plant in your garden so it doesn't fall over or putting a stake on a, on a plant so it doesn't fall over. We're keeping those vines until they harden up. We have to kind of hold that weight up for them. Um, and then they'll harden off later, um, uh, later this uh, summer, early fall. But uh, with the weight of all that branch and all that, that growth, you have to kind of, you have to hold everything up and you keep it going. Are bees important to a vineyard? Yes and no. Grapes self-pollinate. That's why wind and rain is so uh, dangerous. But all the supportive uh, pollinization of other plants that are beneficial to the soils and to our riparian way, which hold um, insects and um, other uh, insects which actually eat the insects that are dangerous to our crop, that's where they're important. So that's why, yes, bees are important in all agriculture, whether it's self-pollinated or not. It's because of the effect they have on all the grasses and plants uh, around those agricultural crops to help uh, other animals and, like I said, soil conditions. Will you explain why wind would, or rain would be dangerous? Uh, because they self-pollinate, what happens is the bees don't take the pollen from the flower to the stamen and move back and forth. And if that, when as that flower is coming out at the right time, wind will either blow it off, like it could rub off, uh, blow it away so the pollen doesn't self-pollinate, or rain doing the same thing. Rain does the same thing to it. It's just it, it interrupts that pollinization period, and by doing that, we get what we call BBs. Remember, we talked about chicks and hens. We get unpollinated uh, or you know un you know unpollinated berries, which then don't ripen correctly. It just looks like a big BB. Um, I missed a question earlier about the Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. the, the vineyard that it's coming from in the Bliss Vineyard. Uh, this what direction is the slope facing? Is it hillside, a valley? Could you explain the Bliss Vineyard a little? Bliss Vineyard is pretty flat. So where all the Bliss wines come from, or all the Bliss vineyards except for block 13, which is where the Brutico comes from, um, actually are pretty flat. There is some sloping to them um, east to west, very minimal um, as far, but the only place that it really has a, a, like a knoll or a knob is block 13, and that's where the Brutico comes from. So that's, it drains a little bit differently, but for, for most much and much it's all flat uh, as far as that goes now Felice being next to the creek uh, the Felice vineyard it does have a little bit more of a pitch that goes towards the creek so and that's again um, east to west uh, is there a difference in the taste of wine from a screw cap to a cork um, I have to say yes but no so the reason why I say that it depends on how it's made if I put the Brutico Chardonnay under screw cap and a cork 
uh, for the same vintage, the same wine, um, it's not going to taste the same because it takes longer for the wine to come out of bottle shock from a cork than it does a screw cap because you're not, doing, you're not pressurizing the bottle. When you put a cork in, you actually shove a cork in, it actually puts pressure on the, on the wine, and that's what's called bottle shock. So you need that to kind of wear off a little bit. Um, actually going through the filters. A screw cap um, allows the wines to be drinkable a little bit sooner because of that. So you could release them earlier if you had to. And that cork is probably gonna let that wine age longer. Uh, because of that fact, because it has, it, it's not getting that same, uh, it's not drinkable as early. Um, and it's because the closures are different, you will get different flavors at different times. So that's why it's yes and no. So maybe at two months you could be drinking a screw cap bottle and it tastes really good, it tastes fine, it's really drinkable, but if you pop the cork, on that same wine, it's not going to be. It's still kind of closed up and in shock, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't taste the same. So. Since you just mentioned bottle shock, can you explain that? I think a lot of people have seen the movie, but it is actually a real thing. Yeah, it's what it's what we call it's from bottling. Anytime you do something to wine, it it changes its flavor profile. It changes its uh, aromatics, and it, it it changes wine. Think of wine, and I always like to think, you know, wine is a living, breathing thing. All right. It's an, it's an organic product, and it lives and it's breathes, and it comes through. Um, so when it has to go through bottling, it usually gets pushed through a filter. So that's kind of, you know, it's, it's like, you know, when you're trying, think about going to the store um, and trying on a bunch of clothes that are too small, you know, and your experience with that. Um, doesn't make you feel too good, right? So when you walk out, so it's the same thing with this wine being shoved through this filter, you know, this, this tight medium to make sure that there's no yeast left behind in, the, in this wine uh, so it won't ferment in the bottle. Um, so that's the reason why we're doing that. So then that's the reason why. So that's the one thing. And then when we put a cork in a bottle, we actually pull a vacuum on it. But at the same time, you still cause some pressure and that vacuum causes that wine to, to, to uh, depressurize at the same time. So it's kind of like pushing and pulling this wine all at the same time. So it kind of wants to go back into hibernation. It's just like, you know, screw you guys. I don't want to play with you anymore. You know, every time we go out, you get me too drunk and you leave me on the side of the road. No, I'm not doing this. So what we're talking about here is that then it takes it about a good year to a year and a half for it to really recover from bottle shock and when it shows its true form. Uh, with a screw cap, you're not doing that because basically the screw cap, it just comes around and if you've seen some of our videos, it just basically drops on and screws on. So you don't have to worry about the pressurized, depressurized into the bottle. It, it's not the same thing. What do legs on the inside of the glass mean? Does it have to do with alcohol content or tannins? Um, that's the way we used to always look for alcohol as legs because it, what it does, it changes the density of the wine. So it just depends on the specific gravity of the wine or the density of it. And alcohol usually shows up on the sides of the glass because um, if you ever took alcohol and sprayed it in water, you see how the water separates? Well, alcohol does the same thing in a glass. So when you spray it, when you swirl it up like this, and you can see the legs coming down, it kind of, if it's got lots and lots of legs, it can tell you how much there's like a ton of alcohol. But that's usually the density, and the alcohol is pushing the, that wine to the side and holding the position. Man, we're getting, so, Lenny set this up by being so scientific about them soils. I, I can see that. How many times can we vote they're from Chicago? Uh. Well, you know, it's all tied up right now. We got 16 votes, so uh, I don't know. Could be winemaker's choice. I'll choose Coors Original. No, I'm just kidding. Moving on through how many times can we vote? Voter fraud in the wine industry. <laughs> Why is somebody from Chicago? figured out how to do it. Yeah. If you log on on different computers, you can. Yeah, you can. Yeah. <laughs> Too funny. Oh. Uh, we had a question earlier about the Chardonnay and the have also mm -hmm. and are they different and so can you speak a little to like some of those 
other labels that we do and um, you know so the bulk wines and it depends on the vintage. Some are the same, some aren't. Um, a lot of times what we do is we will make extra of the Bliss products and we'll have them in a, what's called, we call a shiner, where we don't put a label on it uh, for those programs. We've done a lot of, oh geez, David, what have we done? Six different universities now? Seven? Oh, yeah. Indiana, Notre Dame, LMU. God, there's been a USC. Who else have we done? Yeah, over the Ohio years. State. Ohio, State. Ohio State, yeah. So we've done a lot of them like that for their alumni associations. That's how they, they'll make money. You know, they buy it from us and then they, they sell it on their website type of thing. So, but uh, we do a lot of that. Uh, we do have some, uh, some clients that do, we do a customized bottling for. We do have a custom bottling program. Uh, and sometimes it's a totally different wine uh, that we do that's not the same, uh, especially years that we're short. Um, if it's not a great year for like Chardonnay and we don't have enough uh, of the quality of Chardonnay we need for Bliss and Brutico, we will make another Chardonnay for a different program. Um, always making sure it's good quality wine uh, and a drinkable wine, but we do have standards to where we make sure we always fulfill our Brutico and Bliss uh, first and then go on from there. And there's years that we've had every ounce of uh, wine we had that was extra would have made Bliss. No worries, uh, but there's only so much we can sell in the marketplace, so all depends. Uh, and someone's asking about the Wish brand. Wish you had some more. Uh, that is going to. That's a third brand that we're working on right now, and it's um, it's again, it's going to be a, a another tier below Bliss. Um, so you're going to have when we make wines, and, and when, you know, and I should say. You know, here and when I'm developing wines in the cellar, I develop Reserve, Brutico, Bliss, and then other. So that's where that's coming from. Um, again, we have great grapes. We grow all our own fruit, so we have all that going for us. So a lot of our wines that are other um, are su are superior quality to a lot of stuff that you'd buy on a shelf already at a, at a different at a lower price or a higher price. So that's why we're able to do these things. Win? Never. We planted Malbec. I was waiting. I knew somebody was going to ask. You know, and uh, someday I might actually plant a little Cab Franc, but no, it's not going to be bottled either. Right now, what the Malbec and the Petit Verdot are are blenders, and traditionally that's what they've always been. They are a blender. Um, it is a pro. It's part of the foreseen future for Torrent. Um, that's what Torrance always looking at was being a blended wine, and it's just going to add an extra dimension to take it up another level. Um, it also works. Petit Verdot is a great blender sometimes for your Cabernets and for Merlot, so we might have that if we have a hole to fill. It's all about uplifting programs that we already have and not bottling another one. Now, if by chance, someday we have this great Malbec vintage and we have some left over. We may bottle, you know, 50 cases, 100 cases. Right now, those vines are four years old. They're like a two year old running around in your house. They don't know what they want to do, but they're a pain. So, <laughs> right now, we got, a, we got a good 10 years. About maybe, maybe we'll make a bottle of it. So. Someone asked if we, uh, in one of these pre-shows, could go out to the Malbec or the Petit Verdot and kind of show those vines too. Yeah, that's kind of in the future what we're talking about. In fact, it's funny, me and Kevin were just talking about that today, that we're going to, that's one of the things, we're going to start showing you some of the other varietals, uh, especially when we start talking about these other varietals uh, over the next couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, we'll get out there, show you these vineyards. Um, one of the things that's going to be happening also, just to let you guys, so we start bottling June 1st, and the first thing out of the gate is going to be our Cabernet, so you're actually going to be seeing a little bit more video uh, of the bottling line and maybe some of the processes going up to that. That's why I want to take you guys out to the cellar next week, kind of show you around the cellar, see what's happening, so you can kind of see what we're talking about a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, and then a little bit more of the different vineyard blocks and where we're at. It's a very small section. I think. Uh, 30 rows. I think we get like probably four to five tons of Malbec and Petit Verdot. Um, it's a very small section, so it's not like a big overwhelming section. Uh, do you taste red wine better when it is
down the That's a good question. I taste red wines better before 10 a.m. I mean, I, that's what we taste and blend, I'll be honest with you. My taste buds are fresher, my nose is fresher, I don't have to worry about allergies and the wind blowing a bunch of stuff around. Um, you're usually, it's just like, it's like a fresh thing in the morning. Um, I think red wines, personally, if I'm tasting, I want them a little bit warmer for blending uh, and tasting purposes and winemaker notes because that's when the wine's gonna show its best. When I'm talking warmer, I'm talking like 68, 70 degrees. That's about it. I don't want them hot. Um, when I'm tasting them, I, I don't mind them being cooler. I like warming them up and watching them develop. It's just kind of a fun thing for me. It's kind of like a, your own science experiment, seeing what flavors are there, what, what goes away, and what, and what shows up as the wine warms up. So that's always a fun thing. But I think overall about 68 to 70 degrees max is when the wine's gonna show its best potential. Maybe. <laughs> How's that for a definite possibility? I can be more vague if you want. All right, who just took the lead? We still got a three-way tie. All right, Candelabra's, Candelabra's sucking on the back stretch, I hate to tell you. Huss, do you want to uh, kind of talk about when we make a wine vintage to vintage, sometimes it's a single vineyard, for example, mm -hmm. Bliss Vineyard Chardonnay versus Hopland Ranches Chardonnay. And I think that can be confusing once in a while to people. Um, we don't make more than one Brutico Classic Chardonnay hmm. here. Will you talk about single vineyard versus Hopland Ranches? Well, what happens is that a lot of times when Hopland, when you see Hopland Ranches, it means that we use something from one of the other vineyards. And it's, it all depends on the year, the growing season and Mother Nature. And that's one of the things we're so lucky that we can do is that we have these other vineyards that have these great wines um, that we can add to it. So years that usually it's all bliss. So if it's 100% bliss and it says bliss vineyards on it, that means that that block 13, block 26, 20 and 29, or 27 and 29, sorry, gave us everything we needed for that Chardonnay that year. Uh, everything was there. Every pronounced floral character, whatever I wanted in that wine was there. Years that we have to use um, we don't have to, but the years that we use the Felice Vineyard might be that the Felice ripens at a different point in time than the Bliss because it's on the other side of the valley. So it might have been that we had some weird weather during bloom to where, or, or the, the season, and it didn't ripen the same. Something was a little bit different. And so Felice has a character that, that brings something to it. So it might be that there might be a hole in the mid palate. Seriously, it might be just as simple as that. There's something in that mid palate that's not right. But by adding 5% or 6% of that Felice Vineyard in, it fills that hole and makes it a better wine. My goal here is always to make a better wine. It's never to be Vineyard Select only. It's to be Brutico Select only. So it's all a state. Um, and the law states that if it's less than, if it's over 95% of that one block, we can call it that block. So it has to be 95% minimum from the Bliss block. So if we add 6% from the other ranch, then it has to be called Hopland Ranches. And that's the reason why we go back and forth. You always have to remember though, it's 100% a state fruit that we grow, and we're always, whatever we do, it's to make sure that that wine quality is what you expect it to be every time. And that's the reason why. Um, I don't want to lower our quality levels. I want our quality levels to keep rising and rising and rising. Um, and so that's the reason why you'll see that. And just to reiterate, we only make one classic Chardonnay. Yeah, one we only have one Chardonnay that's Brutico. That's, uh, we call it our classic Chardonnay. The Brutico Chardonnay, there's only one every vintage. It's not two. Um, it's, but that's where you see the label variants go back and forth. I mean, the Chardonnay and the Zen are the ones we see a lot. Yeah, and the Cab now. The Cab, the cab you'll see Contento to Hoppin' Ranches, depending upon if we add Merlot or not, you know, or Syrah or not to it, you're going to see that too. So um, we go back and forth. Uh-oh, Syrah's in the lead, guys. By one vote. Syrah's got everybody beat by one vote. What does sustainable wine grower mean? It means that we grow 
as sustainable as possible. We're growing with the thought that we don't want to do anything to hurt the bees. We don't want to do anything that's going to take away from the soils. We don't do anything that's going to take away from the fish in the creek next to us. So when we're doing sustainable farming, it means that we're using sustainable products. Um, so we're thinking about the future and the environment and the and being stewards of the land. We're trying to make our soils as healthy as possible using, um, not trying to use uh, a petroleum-based products, but trying to use more organic or sustainable products in the soil. Sometimes you have to, sometimes you try not to, but sometimes a vineyard needs that little extra shot. But the thing about being sustainable is that it's always, that, that, that essence is there, but that's your last resort. What we're always doing is we're always doing, as we talked about before, I think, Lynn, the number was 900 tons of compost we put on our ranches this last fall. So of organic compost. So that's what we're trying to do, you know. It'd be a lot cheaper just to put uh, 50 tons of ammonium nitrate or whatever fertilizer you wanted to, right, um, on there. But that's taking care of the soils and it's taking care of the creeks and the fish around us. And so it's being aware of our surroundings, being aware of that we're only basically renting this land until we pass it on to the next generation. So that's sustainable. Okay. and. Uh Bev asks how many skews we have. Too many. And after she asked that, Steve said, Haas, it sounds like Bev wants more skews. Would you like to expand on that or would you like to discuss that at home later? The only skews I like are barber skews. Okay, so let's just keep it that way. How's that? Uh, right now, I think we're up to 28. Is that right? 28 different wines that we make overall, and I'd like it to be 10. So how's that? <laughs> we can start a poll. Yeah. No. Because Steve's going to move to Chicago if we start a poll. <laughs> um, are you worried about the murder hornet? No. Next. No. <laughs> Don't worry about the uh, murder hornet. Have you used chickens to help control insects? Uh, not that I am aware of. No, we have not. Do people use chickens? Yeah. yeah. So that's biodynamics. We buy, you have a hen house, actually a mobile hen house. You take out your vineyard and you turn them loose. You have to go out every night, put them back in so all the coyotes, foxes, skunks, and raccoons don't eat them. Um, and usually they got automatic sensor doors that close up for them. But yeah, it's, it's a program that does. You get fertilizer at the same time. Uh, but again, that's usually that's a biodynamic farming uh, practice to do. Um, a lot of sheep. Yeah, the sheep uses the, the grass maggots are the greatest thing, man. They just they go out and just eat down a lot of stuff, and that's a lot of vineyards around us that do that. Uh, we at this time, point in time have not. Um, we've talked about maybe possibly venturing out that way and using that a little bit more, but um, but not at this time. No, we haven't. Um, do you know where the, we get the compost uh, and its source? Is it horse uh, poop or vegetable? No, a lot of these compost companies, um, I'm not sure where the compost came from, the company that we got it from, but most of these guys are the guys that, all right. So when a whale washes up on the beach and, you know, the scientists get done checking it out, the compost guys go and grab it. Cold Creek Compost up here in Ukiah, out of Ukiah, actually have gotten like the last five or six whales uh, that have washed up on the, on the, from the ocean over the years. They take them, they bury them. So what they do is they actually go and get stuff from all over the place. So they're getting all that. All those different uh, animal excrements plus all the dead animals from Caltrans. Not kidding. Um, and they get then they're getting mulch from and sawdust from the um, different mills around, and it's just it's a conglomeration of a lot of different stuff. We're also composting skins and stems from our. Grapes. Yeah, and the thing about stem, about the thing about composting, what we call pumice, which is what's left over, is it has. It has some effects and it has some good nutrients in it, but it still needs to be mixed with some other organics, uh, especially some other manures to, to be fully effective. So it, um, it, it, it brings something back to the soil, uh, but you still need just that little bit more. John and Cindy would like to point out that compost is like sausage. You don't ask how it gets made. Yes, that is very true. 
And Kenna thought she tasted a hint of whales. Beluga, I believe. <sighs> and skins aren't cow food. In Arkansas, they feed the skins to the, the grape skins to the cows. Hogs. So I had a buddy of mine who used to raise a lot of hogs. He had like 300 head up in Red Valley. And he used to come get pumice for me. He'd get white pumice and red pumice. They would not touch the white pumice. They wanted the red pumice because it had alcohol in it, because it was fermented skins. So usually the, you know, it is a good feed. Animals will eat it, but uh, it makes a better fertilizer than a feed. But those are some happy hogs. I'll tell you what, those bowling balls are racking up left and right because they take old bowling balls and throw them into pins so they don't stress out, gives them something to play with. Oh my God, it, was, it sounded like a drunken bowling alley up there. It was funnier than hell. All right. Well, we might be closing out this voting real quick here, so you might want to vote. One last time, Chicago, hurry up, get in there. We got Barbera in the lead by two votes. Look out. Candelabra second. Syrah and Sangiovese are tied for third. Well, Barbera's running away with it. So I know if you guys have followed along all these times, that one soil that we did where it dramatically changed from uh, that, that gray soil to that red volcanic soil, that was the Barbera. So if Barbera is the winner, we'll go back out there and we'll shoot a picture showing you how tall the vines have gotten now and, uh, and see that again in that vineyard. So we'll definitely go do that. Um, but the other thing we'll probably try to do is we'll talk about the barrel profiles we use for all these different wines too and why we use those barrels, uh, why they actually, we feel they work so well. So um, I think we're calling this. I think we're, we're... Real quick, what was the um, the cheese company from a couple weeks ago? Oh, God. Um, summer? Shepherd's... Sh yeah, Shepherd's Manor. Shepherd's Manor. Shepherd's Manor. Shepherd's Manor Creamery in Windsor, Maryland. God, look at that. Don't ask me why I can remember that. Mm. All right, this is it. What do we got? It's Barbera. That's it. We're calling it. It's over. We're calling the race. All right, guys, so next week we're going to do 2016 Barbera. We'll go back out to the Barbera Vineyard. Uh, we'll take some shots out there, um, kind of show you what's going on, um, and then uh, we'll do a little uh, winery tour inside. Uh, we'll probably, st we're not sure what we're going to do. It's going to be a little bit different. Uh, you won't start with me here. We'll probably start with me actually in the winery. We'll talk about what's going on in the winery a little bit more, show you some different things, and then uh, um, and then we'll go into, uh, we'll taste the wine, talk about the wine, why that barrel selection we use on that wine a little bit more, a little more in depth, and, uh, and, have, us, and have some fun. Um, I think unless there's any other outstanding questions we need to answer right now, and other than the meaning of life, I can't answer that for you. Um, on the pre-show, if we're going to do a pre-show, uh, like a little tour of the winery, what time should people log in? Let's, uh, I think we're going to do, we're not sure yet. I mean, me and Kevin are kind of working this out. Um, we're going to play with it. If it works out right, we're actually going to start the tasting in the winery. Uh, we'll pre-show the vineyards, and we might start with me actually in the winery, showing you guys around a little bit at 530, uh, instead of doing a pre-show with it. And then come back around, and, uh, and then uh, we'll show another short video why I get my butt back here to taste. Um, we're going to play around with that, I wouldn't say, but always, I would say by 5.15, wouldn't you say, Kevin? Always by 5.15, be, uh, be ready. Um, and, uh, and if it is a pre-show, remember, we will show it again afterwards. Um, and we post them on YouTube. Yeah, we post it on YouTube and stuff. And, um, but I think it would be kind of more fun for me to do it live at 5.30, so that way, if you, have your question, if you have questions about it, when I come back and sit down and talk about the Barbera, we can talk about those. And uh, if it works out right, hopefully I can actually get your questions 
while I'm out there and kind of point to things and talk about things a little bit more. So uh, like I said, a little different format, a little bit more fun. We'll probably just start with one section of the winery. We'll probably talk a little bit more about the tank room, maybe oak alternatives a little bit more out in the tank room. And then the following week, we'll go into the barrel room. Uh, we'll look at all the different barrels, the different wines that are out there right now. Um, you know, and um, we'll see. Maybe we'll thief some barrels. Uh, maybe that's something we might do the week of June uh, first. So we'll play around and have some fun. All right. So again, as always, everybody, uh, thank you so much uh, for participating in this. It's always a pleasure to hang out with you guys and go through all these wines and see if I can talk an hour straight. It's a great thing to do. Um, anyway, as always, don't never forget, the only difference between a wine connoisseur is a wine is a wine connoisseur pulls a brown paper bag off when he's done drinking. Thank you so much. And yes, this is my favorite Hawaiian shirt that I got in Maui. So uh, salute, ching ching, have fun everybody, stay safe, happy Memorial Day.